Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about somatic senses. So somatic senses arise from stimulation of sensory receptors in the skin, mucous membranes, muscles, tendons, and joints. So the word soma means body. So anything somatic we're talking about of the flesh, of the body, compared to something visceral would be like of the internal organs. Okay, so somatic, we're talking about the flesh. So sensory stimulation coming from the skin, mucous membranes, muscles, tendons, and joints. So somatic senses include tactile, thermal, pain, and proprioception. And then of course, within each of those, we have different types of those senses and different receptors that, that deliver that information. So tactile includes several different things. That includes touch, uh, so we have receptors in the skin or subcutaneous layer. Uh, pressure is a tactile sense. Uh, that sustained sensation that is felt over a larger area and occurs in deeper tissues than touch. So touch is more superficial, like a light touch, versus pressure is what we feel when, when more force is exerted and that um, sensation is delivered to deeper tissues. Vibration is an interesting one because it's actually oscillation of activation of sensory receptors. So it results from rapidly repetitive sensory signals from tactile receptors. So it's sort of an oscillation on off, on off, on off of um, tactile sensory receptors. And the brain interprets that sort of oscillation as vibration. Itch is the stimulation of free nerve endings by certain chemicals, often because of local inflammatory response. Okay, so itch, you know, caused by like a bug bite or any kind of irritation. Um, that's when uh, usually we have chemicals that are stimulating a free nerve ending. And then that gives you the urge to swat at it or scratch um, because it could be a bug or something that is causing that itch. Tickle is another really interesting one. Um, we say probably mediated by free nerve endings because it's a little bit unknown, it's less understood. Um, and the reason we can't tickle ourselves is because the cerebellum knows what you're doing. <laughs> um, so the cerebellum is comparing your plan for movement with what actually occurs in the body. So the actual movement that you engaged in. So the cerebellum in the brain always knows what you're doing. So you can't tickle yourself because your cerebellum knows that it's you causing that stimulation. Um, so tickle is thought to be uh, a function in primates where adult primates are teaching their young how to protect sensitive areas. Um, so if you think about where most of us are ticklish, it's usually like, you know, maybe the neck or uh, the axillary area or the groin area or behind the knees. So sensitive areas where if you were in a fight in the wild with another animal or who knows what, um, those are areas that you would want to protect because injuries to those areas could be life-threatening. Uh, so it's thought that tickling is a fun way for uh, adult primates to teach their young about protecting those sensitive areas. But you can't tickle yourself because the cerebellum knows that it's you uh, rather than someone else causing that stimulation. Okay, thermal is detected by thermoreceptors, which are free nerve endings. Uh, these are rapidly adapting, uh, meaning that we don't continue to send signals continuously, uh, but they do still send more spaced apart. So we are still sending signals as long as the stimulus persists, but way more spaced apart. So we're not just constantly aware of the temperature. Um, so it's more like you're inside the house and you walk outside and you are aware of the temperature as you walk outside. Maybe it's very hot or very cold. Um, so you're detecting that difference and that change in stimulus, and then you sort of forget about it unless it's extreme enough to continue to be a problem, uh, like really, really hot or really, really cold, and it continues to be important. So you'll send more signals more frequently. So we have cold receptors located in the epidermis, so the more superficial portion of the skin. 
and they are activated by temperatures between 50 and 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so cold receptors aren't really that cold. <laughs> uh, warm receptors are a little bit deeper in the skin. Those are in the dermis, activated by much hotter temperatures, but overlapping with the cold receptors. So 90 to 118 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, now, any temperature above or below these ranges are detected by the nociceptors, which are our pain receptors. Um, so anything colder than 50 degrees Fahrenheit or hotter than 118 degrees Fahrenheit um, is detected via our pain pathways. So we do stay aware of those because those are slowly adapting receptors. So that information is constantly continuously sent to the brain so that we maintain our awareness of those more, more dangerous temperatures. Uh, so pain is detected by nociceptors. Those are pain receptors. Uh, we have them in practically every tissue of the body except for the brain. Uh, they respond to lots of types of stimuli um, and really their intention is to detect potential damage. So stimuli that potentially could be damaging to our tissues. So they send a pain signal to alert us that something might be causing us harm. So lots of different stimuli will trigger pain. So it could be excessive stimulation of sensory receptors. So any kind of excessive stimulus of any variety will also trigger the pain receptors. So think about like bright, really painfully bright light or really painfully loud noise. Um, those are some examples. Excessive stretching of a structure, so like a tensile force where we're stretching something. Uh, prolonged muscular contractions. Inadequate blood flow is a huge source of pain. Think about if something is not receiving enough blood, it's going to die. Uh, our blood is delivering oxygen and nutrients and things that a tissue and cells require to stay alive. Uh, so if a tissue or cells are not receiving enough blood flow, that is life-threatening to those tissues and cells. So anytime we don't have enough blood flow, the alert signal goes off saying something bad's happening. We are in, at risk here. And so that is our pain response to lack of blood flow. Um, so I, I read somewhere recently that it, it's thought that uh, around 70% of our somatic pain, like our musculoskeletal fascial pain is due to inadequate blood flow. And I believe that. Um, and we call that ischemia, meaning reduced or lack of blood flow. Uh, so lack of blood flow causes a lot of pain. That's why massage, stretching, um, heat, related therapies, exercise, all of those things reduce a lot of our myofascial pain. And that's because it's increasing our blood flow to those areas. Uh, presence of certain chemical substances can cause pain. Um, so like there are all kinds of things that if we got it on our skin would hurt. Um, and then that also applies to our internal environment. And then finally, we have proprioception. Uh, that is our sense of where the body is in space in relation to our environment and relation to ourselves. So that includes the brain knowing uh, like the position of all of our joints, the position of our body and how we're interacting with our environment. And that's without any visual feedback. So it's the reason that you can walk, type, get dressed, um, do all kinds of things without having to look at what you're doing. Um, so like I'm willing to bet most of you can probably type without looking or a lot of you can type without looking. That's because of your proprioception or you can brush your teeth with your eyes closed. You can walk with your eyes closed. That's all because of proprioception because of the sensory feedback coming from the many tissues of the body going to the brain to tell the brain how our muscles are contracting, what position our joints are in, how much force is going through different tissues. So the brain can sort of make a map of where we are, how we're moving and where we are in relation to our environment based on previous visual information that we've stored from before. Okay, thank you for watching.